OK, so without further ado, I'm going to um, like to introduce um, Joe. So Joe, if you'd like to set up your, your screen for us and that we'll get that ready to go. So Joe and Taylor, as I say, is head of apprenticeships at the University of Suffolk, and she is going to give you um, some lots of um, information about what it's like from the training providers point of view with regards to apprenticeships. So Joe, I'm going to hand the floor over to you and then we can share your screen when you are ready to share it. So welcome everyone. My name is Joanne Taylor um, uh, and as I've been introduced, I'm the Head of Apprenticeships at the University of Suffolk. Um, hopefully today, um, rather than bombard you with more information, will be quite informative, um, giving you a bit of an overview of how I got to where I am, um, which was as an apprenticeship route. So without giving away my age, um, I started my working career many years ago at the age of 16 um, and I went into uh, an apprenticeship as an architectural technician. Um, I soon found out that um, I had an uh, undiagnosed um, uh, learning disability. So um, unfortunately I couldn't continue with my architectural technician career, but I was very uh, interested in the construction um, environment. So I was able to sort of sidestep and uh, finish my apprenticeship by undertaking um, construction site management. Um, so that led me, having spent sort of 25 years um, in the commercial sectors, um, I've been a director and obviously uh, a business owner. I am um, a trainer in my own right and an assessor. I also do uh, internal quality auditing um, and endpoint assessment as well. So um, I didn't start out to be in the educational field, but um, one thing to remember is that I don't think anyone um, it ends up where potentially they wanted to be. Um, I think it's about having an interest in something to uh, to move your career forward and and learning those skills, knowledge, skills and behaviours that will set you up um, so that you can sidestep into areas of interest. And I think that's very much what my uh, what my role when I when I left school, that was very much me. I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, um, but I picked an area of interest. I was very interested in art, so when I heard that there was an architectural technician apprenticeship available, I thought that was the next best fit for me. So it's about choosing something that that, that you're interested in and you have a passion for. Um, I've only been at the University of Suffolk for just over a year. Um, and you can probably tell by my accent that I am not Suffolk bred and born. Um, I um, uh, have been, as I said, in education probably for about 25 years. So I've seen the changing face of apprenticeships um, and the changing face of education as well. Um, when I first came to Suffolk, I decided to finish my uh, my um, master in science um, in business and management. And I'm actually enrolled as a part time student as I was a business owner at the University of Suffolk. So I'm actually an alumni of uh, the university and I graduated in 2018. Um, and little did I know that two years later, you know, I would be taking up a position as head of apprenticeships at the university. So this is this is the sort of pathway that these things take us. Uh, we never quite know what's what's available. Um, I do have a passion for education. Um, I'm still very heavily involved in in research opportunities and coaching and mentoring women into the construction sector. Um, but alongside, and I know we've got our NECO representatives, but I'm actually also a volunteer careers, careers advisor with the Careers Enterprise Trust. So I currently partner at um, Ipswich Academy. And obviously that's, uh, that's sharing those meaningful engagements and employability areas of opportunity for secondary education. So if I am, um, and I'm sure most of you have probably seen this already, um, a bit of a route about what apprenticeships are. So it doesn't matter what level 
um, fundamentally, you must be an employee. So you uh, would source yourself um, a job role, which is an apprenticeship job role. Um, you will be treated as an employee of that company. So you will have a contract of employment, earning a wage and you'll receive all the statutory benefits. So, you know, things like sick pay, um, holiday entitlement and that sort of thing. Um, all apprenticeships work alongside uh, experienced members of staff for 80% of their contractual hours. So unlike going to full time um, college or, or sick, thought, sick form where you're there all the time, you're actually at work for 80% of the time. Um, and the rest of the time, the 20% is actually spent off the job. And that's when you will attend uh, your training provider or attend lectures, um, et cetera, as well. So that's the theory part. So the 80% is the practical parts of the job that you will be learning. And you learn those by working alongside experienced members of staff. Um, employees obviously are eligible for apprenticeships where an employer can demonstrate uh, the, the job specific skills enable a person to learn the new knowledge, skills and behaviours. So it's a little bit harder when we start thinking about higher and degree apprenticeship education because those people seem to, uh, 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 are normally um, a little bit older. They've been exposed to the working environments. They have quite a demanding job role or quite a senior role within the organisation. So as long as they are, we can demonstrate that they are learning new knowledge, skills and behaviours um, that work alongside that job, then they are eligible for an apprenticeship. And I mentioned it before, apprenticeships must receive. So the employer will give um, the apprentice time up, time off for training and study, study during the working week, which is related to their role. So this is the 20% that we were talking about. And it's approximately 20% of the normal working hours. Um, obviously, depending on the level of apprenticeship, um, depends on the duration. So we say it takes between one to five years. Um, in some of the construction um, sectors that I've worked in previously, some of those apprenticeships are only a year. Um, and obviously, it, as you go on to do a higher apprenticeship, they tend to get a little bit longer because obviously the academic criteria is a little, a little bit more demanding. Um, and at the end of the uh, practical learning period um, with the training provider, apprenticeships were entering into um, a gateway process. Um, so they've completed all their elements and then they're ready for an endpoint assessment, which is either an external assessment or an integrated one. So if I use the um, university as an example, we have both integrated and external endpoint assessments. And that basically means that if it's integrated, although we do it as part of the university, um, someone that has, uh, has still got occupational competency and is familiar with that uh, sector specific will conduct that endpoint assessment, but they wouldn't have taught you on the programme. That's the stipulation. If it's an external endpoint assessment, that would mean uh, uh, an organisation that's registered as an endpoint assessment organisation, which actually would undertake that assessment. So that, although that is a formal assessment process, it can be um, an examination, it can be a panel interview, it can be a portfolio. Um, it's very much a practical um, element that's alongside what you would have learnt as part of your apprenticeship. So that's a bit of a whistle stop tour um, about the statutory elements um, of an apprenticeship and an apprenticeship journey. As I said, the, uh, there are levels um, of apprenticeships. So if you are 16 years of age, just about to leave school, it is highly likely that you would join an intermediate level two because you've not yet been exposed other than obviously any voluntary work or work experience. You've not been exposed to that working environment in that specific se um, sector before. So you would always start off at that sort of level two area. 
Um, and we've put there what the equivalent educational level is. So a level two is equivalent to the GCSEs, which obviously most of you will be familiar with. Um, some apprenticeships have an additional qualification added to them, such as a diploma or obviously a degree or a master's degree, um, depending on what level. And as all the thumb, the more experienced um, the person is or the job role level of responsibility, the higher level of that apprenticeship. So as I said again, if you were 16 to 18, you might join at a level two. Um, if you were 18 and over, but with very little experience, you, you may well be able to join directly at level three. By the time you get to join in sort of levels four and above, you would have probably a more senior role within an organisation and therefore you would be able to enter because you'd meet the eligibility criteria and the entry requirements um, of the training provider and the organisation. So for the University of Suffolk, we only engage, we don't take individual applications from students in relation to apprenticeships, we actually source those with the employers that we work with. So your first point of call would be to get gain the job as an apprentice, and then you would uh, join as a student at the University of Suffolk on an apprenticeship programme. Um, as I said, the uh, using obviously my experience, the um, one of the most important things is that if you are unsure about what sort of direction you would wish to take um, and you think I would uh, like a career um, as a veterinary nurse, um, for instance, but I don't know if there's an apprenticeship for it, I would signpost people to the Institute for Apprenticeships so you can see if there is a current standard available. So that's not necessarily the qualification, it's the standard that the training provider would work to. So if you go onto the Institute for Apprenticeships, you can put some keywords in there, search for veterinary nurse or um, I don't know, um, theatre production assistant or something like that, whatever you're interested in. And it should bring you up a list of um, uh, apprenticeships that are approved um, and you can also search for training providers in your area that um, are actively delivering those apprenticeships. We've got some information obviously on our website, which is um, uos.ac.uk. Um, that will give you um, some information on some of those higher uh, degree apprenticeships and postgraduate um, apprenticeships that we offer. Um, but more importantly, is to, uh, to search employer websites as well as media ones. Um, a lot of people think that apprenticeships only start in September, which is not the case at all. I would choose to start my research as soon as possible um, because as and when apprenticeships are made available, employers will uh, notoriously post them on their on their uh, their own website anyway under their vacancies and obviously there's many to, that you can see that come up in the media so um, obviously if uh, the local media that we use um, if anybody is uh, advertising you would be able to source from there and it would always say trainee or an apprenticeship position that will be attached to it. So at least you know what you've got to be looking for. But always start your searches quite early on. The other one um, for general um, apprenticeship information and applications is to get registered on the government apprenticeships website, which is obviously um, you should be able to see on the screen. So that's dub.uk forward slash apply hyphen apprenticeship. Um, and that will give you some really, really good information register to actually search for an apprenticeship geographically. Um, and that's the most important thing. Unless you're thinking about moving to London, you don't want a list of apprenticeships that are in London. You want them in your regional um, sector. Um, and just to reiterate that the, the University of Suffolk 
engage with the employer rather than taking applications for apprentices from an individual. So we work with the likes of BT, the National Health Service um, and many other organisations and we will source the apprenticeships from them. Um, and nine times out of ten, they will put them on the, their employer website. They will speak to us and then they will say we have X amount of apprenticeships that we apprentices that we wish to send to you and we're going to send them to you on on these dates. So that's how we engage with our apprentices. But if you do have any problems, obviously do pose them to uh, to Rio um, at, at Nico, um, who is your first point of contact. And I will also be sharing um, our apprenticeships email address if you have any direct questions to any uh, apprenticeships uh, that we offer. So currently um, at the University of Suffolk, we roughly have about 600 apprentices at any given time. Um, at the moment, um, they are covered across the school areas. So we've got the School of Health and Sports Science, um, whereby at level five, we do an assistant practitioner and a nursing associate uh, route. So that's a level five higher, higher apprenticeship. Um, and then we have a level six, which is a registered nursing element, which is either in adult or mental health. In the business school currently, we undertake the senior leader um, and the chartered managers. Um, and, uh, and we will be introducing some additional apprenticeships as well in the in, in um, uh, probably for the academic year of 2021-2022. So we have some um, uh, going through processes now. Uh, we're waiting for them to be approved by the Institute for Apprenticeships. So there will be more coming, um, but we don't spread ourselves too thinly, obviously with the apprenticeships either. Um, we also engage with the Social Science and Humanities School for their social work. Again, this is a, a level six, so this is a level, level six degree apprenticeship. Um, and the School of East, uh, which is the um, Engineering, Arts, Science and Technology School, um, and currently we uh, we engage again with a level six degree in digital technology sy uh, systems or solutions in either network or software. So that's a little bank about what the University of Suffolk actually offer in relation to their apprenticeships. And again, we will um, speak with our with our list of um, uh, contacts of our employers um, to gain those. So. Uh, nine times out of ten, they recruit, they start recruiting any time from now. Um, June is a big time uh, for apprenticeship applications as well, because a lot of programmes do start in September. But the university um, tends to have applicants from, you know, se uh, September starts, January starts, February starts. We've got some May starts, so they're, they're getting more and more frequent because apprenticeships are, are, are driven by the employer need. So, uh, so we are seeing that our enrolments seem to be uh, more and more throughout the year rather than just a fixed fixed point in time, which used to be very much sort of September and January. Um, so that's something to bear in mind when, when obviously you're doing research as well. I wanted to speak a little bit about um, enhancing applications because as a business owner myself and what I look for, um, how you can actually enhance. We know it's a very, very competitive um, part um, of the world of work now. It is very, very competitive. There are lots of people going after the same job role as you. Um, and it's also important that not only do you do your research, but the documentation that is sent to you, you fill that in to meet that criteria and that can make all the difference from you getting the job over somebody else. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time giving you some hints and tips of how you can enhance the application and what sort of things employers look for as well, which is quite important. So um, the first one is, uh, I always get asked the question, 
do I meet the essential and desirable criteria of the job role? Well, the first thing to do is that you look at the job description and the personal criteria, and that will list what the essential criteria is and the desirable. So the difference is, as an employer, if I put down it's essential, that means that I'm going to shortlist everyone that meets that essential criteria. I am 100% going to shortlist. If they've got the added bonus of meeting some of the desirable, then obviously they, they're definitely going to make the shortcut. If someone puts an application in thinking, I'll just give it a go, but I don't meet the essential or desirable, the chances are you really are not going to get um, shortlisted to obviously gain the position, to even gain an interview. So do be selective and if you meet the essential criteria but don't meet the desirable, I would not be put off of making an application. It's, where, it's, it's if you don't meet any of the essential criteria, um, that's the most important. In um, apprenticeship applications, they do tend to put um, entry level of, uh, of education uh, on the application. So the next question is to ask, do, do you meet the entry requirements? So if the application states that you must hold a level two pre-qualification or a level three pre-qualification, if you don't, that's going to be their essential criteria. So it's not going to be worth you at that point making an application if you don't meet the entry level requirement because the chances are there's going to be a lot more people applying for that role that actually do hold that criteria. Um, what it will tell you is that perhaps you need to change direction or wait a little bit longer because you're not quite at that level yet. Um, again, I wouldn't be put off. Um, it would just guide me as to what I need to get in order to be eligible in the future. And the most important thing um, I can probably share with you is many, many organisations now are asking that you hold at least English and maths um, at, uh, at a fairly high level um, as an entry level of education. However, in a lot of apprenticeships, the English and maths is a lot more flexible. If you're um, thinking about going on to college, um, so many further education providers will include English and maths um, uh, alongside the, uh, the, the apprenticeship that you're undertaking. So they will do that, that English and maths with you. By the time you come to sort of studying um, at university level, so the higher educational level, we actually put it as a pre-requirement that you hold English and maths at the equivalent of a level two um, or, or obviously a, a high level qualification. So that's the equivalent of sort of like an A-level um, entry requirement. And the reason being um, is because at higher education level, um, the academic criteria is quite demanding. And remember, you're studying alongside working. So, you know, we think it's unfair for people to be studying English and maths alongside quite a high academic um, and demanding job role at the same time. So uh, we, we wish to support and obviously our apprentices to achieve. So therefore our uh, entry requirements for English and maths are obviously set that you would have that um, level before you join us. So um, another question I get asked quite a lot is how do you capture the employer's attention on an application? Um, uh, more, more so often than not, a lot of people are not asking for personal statements, but if they are, and I'm sure obviously a lot of schools will tell you this anyway, make them short, punchy, um, and to grab somebody's attention. So it's a bit like if anyone watches Dragon's Den, it's, we call it sort of a bit of an elevator pitch, um, which is a bit, bit of a business term really. And it's something that's going to grab someone's attention. So if you walked into a room 
and you've never met somebody before, you need to go over and introduce yourself. Um, think of it like that. You are practically um, introducing yourself on a piece of paper or uh, by an electronic method. So you want to grab that person's attention. Um, and if you are uh, quite a shy person, um, don't um, over exaggerate your personal statement, um, but put in what you feel comfortable with. Um, that's always uh, that's always a, a, a good thing that I would suggest to anybody. So keep within your comfort and what you feel comfortable talking about. Um, it's very, very hard to uh, to put yourself forward, but it really, really can make the difference between you getting the job over somebody else. So that's really, really important. Um, and another question, um, which which is not the same as the previous, but what can you do differently that other applicants do? So if I give you an example, um, I hear or I see quite a lot on applications um, that these people, you know, people uh, uh, are a very good team player or um, have got very good organisational skills. Well, that's just a statement that's not actually given an example. Um, as an employer, I would like to see that somebody is putting down why they've got good organisational skills or why they think they're a good team player. So if you're going to use a statement like that, remember 100 to 2 other applicants are going to be using exactly the same word. So either use an alternative word or back it up with an example. I am good at organising because I when um, when I was in the school cubs, uh, you know, just the, the scouts. Um, I led a team in a particular exercise. That would be a really, really good statement to put in rather than just say you've got really good organisational skills. So if you have been a member of a club or done any voluntary work or any work experience, try to get that on your application as part of that selling technique to make your application stand out over other applicants. That's so we call it transferable skills. Anything that you've got or you've learnt through any any method, um, an employer is going to be looking at it saying that person might not have that, that uh, meet the profile at the moment, but have they got the ability that I can work with them and I can teach them this and they will pick up the job. Um, nine times out of ten, employers are looking for someone that A, most importantly, turns up on time. Um, and secondly, will um, be open to opportunity. And when I say that, a willingness to learn. Um, and we, we, we all remember when we first started um, our first jobs. It is very, very daunting. But if you go there with an open mind and you uh, are willing to learn from the people that are around you, um, you will always have an employer that will, will, will support you through your uh, learning process. So hopefully that's given you a bit of um, a whistle stop tour about how you can enhance your applications. And I'm sure there will there will be questions if anyone wants to pose them to me. Um, as part of National Apprenticeship this week, obviously we've been posting at the University of Suffolk um, some of our success stories and what our students and employers have to say. So this is just a bit of a selection. So we've taken from um, this is uh, one of our employers, the first one um, at the uh, Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Trust, um, where obviously the benefits to them as an organisation is the service and skills units benefit from skilled staff. Obviously, by sending them to the University of Suffolk, we're actually teaching them the theory elements behind that role and they're actually carrying that out in practice in their working environments. Um, and many obviously of our apprentice students are frontline um, students working very operationally. And um, we've got a couple more on there, um, which gives a flavour of if you're unsure about um, exploring an apprenticeship route, 
there's there's nothing better than actually earn we call earn while you learn um, you are earning a salary um, an, a, a, a minimum apprenticeship salary amount but you're also learning as well which you don't have to pay for um, because it's funded so at the end of the day it's a very very good progressive route and it can take you off into very many directions um, as I've explained and I think I'm testament to that that I started off in one field um, and I've obviously ended up somewhere else but I've enjoyed my journey along the way and I've developed myself as as I've gone along so hopefully that's um that's the whistle stop tour if you do have any direct questions you can pose them to obviously Nico um, I've put the University of Suffolk apprenticeships email address on there which is apprenticeships at uos.ac.uk do go on to the website um, the apprenticeships area is under our business section and it will give a little bit there's a video on there which will talk about what higher and degree apprenticeships are and it will have some useful information on there as well and we're adding to it all the time and you'll be able to read some of the student stories on there as well so there is uh, one question so far and please do as joe just said please do send your questions uh, now that'd be fantastic the first question uh, joe we have here is um will i if I successfully apply for apprenticeship um, and the University of Suffolk is the training provider, will I be considered as a University of Suffolk student while I'm doing my apprenticeship? So that's an interesting one. That's a very good question. Um, yes, you will. So anyone, whether you're an apprentice, apprentice or fee paying student, all our students get exactly the same benefits. So you will be able to join the, you know, the student union, you'll be able to use the library services and all the relevant support services across the university. So you are treated exactly the same as any other student at the University of Suffolk. Awesome, thank you. OK, next question. So it says, do I apply through the, I know you kind of mentioned this before, but I guess this is to clarify, uh, do I apply through the University of Suffolk or do I apply it through the employer? Okay, so um, we only take applications from the employer. So you gain the, you gain the job, so you'll go through a recruitment exercise with the employer they will tell you that the apprenticeship is delivered by the University of Suffolk, but you have to gain the job first. So you go through the same um, application with the employer and then once that is secured and you gain that job role, you will have to then apply to the university and that's done in conjunction with the employer. So obviously we will not engage with you until you have that 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 job secured with that employer because we're not able to um, obviously take applications direct for an apprentice. So that's the difference. So we would go through the, the employer. Wonderful. Thank you so much 